Boston Kansas State with 18 Will Howard. Welcome into the KSO show. Mason Voth, KSU underscore fan, and Drew Galloway here with you. If I sound rough, look rough, it is because I got home at a little after 2.30 last night, and uh, I probably didn't fall asleep until after 3.30. I was I, I was laying there. I was like, there's no way I'm falling asleep right now. I'm, 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 I'm too jacked up right now to, to fall asleep. I'd gotten to that point, but eventually I did, and uh, 8.15 came rather quickly to, to get ready for all of this, but uh, it's easy to do when it's a Wildcat victory. 31-27, to K-State wins their 15th straight over KU. A glorious experience for at least the three of us. I'm sure many others out there. And uh, I, the, the view that I have on this is that this game gets more stressful for those of us that are uh, K-State alums or fans or you know however you want to group yourself into it because you are in a situation where like this longer the streak goes, the more stress and intensity that is put into that game. And, you know, I was talking to uh, my, my, my pal, Alec Bussey, now a, a cyclone reporter uh, after the game last night. Yeah. RIP. He, and he was talking, he was like, yeah, but like, w- wasn't tonight more fun than like showing up and all those beat downs. I said, no, not really. Like I had zero, I had zero fun during that game. There was no fun to be had. I had fun the first drive when K-State scored, and it looked like every other Sunflower showdown. Um, and maybe I had fun when Phillip Brooks caught that first down pass. But really nothing else about last night was fun. It was it was stressful. I said, you know, if this was a game that, like, they traded wins every year or, you know, K-State went, you know, like a Ron Prince stretch and they lost three straight, then, yeah, maybe it would be fun to have kind of one of those epic comeback wins, close game and all that. But – you don't want that streak to go away if you're a K-Stater. And so for them to, to scratch and claw and get to 15 straight last night when it looked dead in the water, it didn't look good. Uh, it just felt like a lot of things were not going how would you know help them. Um, that was a big deal. And obviously, it's a big deal to the players on the team. But this is this is the one game that transcends and, and means just as much or more to the fans in terms of like, really everything because I always explain to people like this that are like, well, you know, you're probably putting too much stock into what 18 to 22 year old kids do for, for your school. But like how K-State plays football and basketball and everything else, it's a representation of the three of us and anybody else that ever went to K-State. And we're proud of K-State because we all have memories and experiences that we love about K-State. Like, yeah, I mean, I, I got a, a great education at K-State and, I mean, a great stuff that helped me uh, for my career down the road. But stuff I like about K-State is, you know, the friends that I met. I met my wife there. And so there's so many things that, that K-State becomes so important to me about. And the best way for K-State to be represented is for them to do well in stuff like football. And you want to be able to get one over on Kansas. And that's why this is so much of a bigger deal. So, uh, uh, last night was, was important. And obviously the team found it important to, to get over the hump and fight and get to that 15th straight win. And it means a lot more to, I think probably the people outside of the team, uh, that, that went to K state than the people even on the team. And I know that it was important to them. So I think it's a significant deal. And, uh, I don't know, just props to K state for, for what they were able to, to go out and do last night. Cause it, it wasn't enjoyable for 60 minutes, but, the next 365 days are going to be very enjoyable. Yeah, that, I mean, look, this is a good win for K-State. I know, um, I, I think I tweeted out this morning, some people might not like it, but, you know, we've got so used to beating KU soundly besides, you know, maybe the 2018 game where it was a four-point game and K-State probably should have lost mm-hmm. toward the end of Snyder. But we got used to just destroying them over the last 15 seasons for the most part. And, uh, as long as Leipold is there, you know, we're just not used to KU being a soundly coached, well-run football program. And they really are. And they have an adequate amount of talent. And as long as that's the case, this is probably going to be a competitive game. And at some point, the streak will end. Hopefully not in my lifetime, but <laughs> you never know. Um, that was the 33rd third win in my lifetime, by the way. So um, 
I'll take that. I'll take 15 in a row. Yeah, and you're only yeah. like 40 years old. <laughs> That's true. And I'll take, you know, I'll take a game that wasn't pretty, that wasn't uh, necessarily what we wanted to see uh, in a win. But I'm like you, Mason. I don't want this game to be close. I don't. These yeah. people that say, well, I'd like this to be competitive. No, that's just dumb. That's stupid. We want to beat them by three or four touchdowns every year. And I think that's going to be a lot tougher to do as long as Lance Leipold is their coach. But uh, I'll take a win any way we can get it. And we got 15 in a row. Yeah, I mean, I think the my kind of takeaway from this is like 15 straight over one opponent, and especially being like your biggest rival, is unheard of. It's like the fact that K-State can keep this rolling for another 365 days, like the streak will come to an end. But this is just absurd with the, the role that K-State is on. I mean, George W. Bush was president. I was nine years old the last time that uh, KU beat K-State. It's like Mason talked about how like he didn't want to have like the 10 year old of him come out. The, the, the nine year old of me was starting to come out a little bit in some text last night. And, and we know that there's so much of a, a leap from emotional intelligence from nine years old to 10 years old. Like, the, you know, those are <laughs> oh, those are yeah, so much of a different age, you know. So, like, it, it's just crazy to think that like 15 years has gone by and like the, the streak is now able to drive to work and to school. Wow. Restricted. <laughs> And I've seen an 11 year streak and a 15 year old streak in my lifetime. So it's like, it's like a, a 35 year old, his two kids, their ages. <laughs> uh, that's, I look, it's, it's incredible what they've been able to do. And the, the streak is very impressive. It's a lot of fun. And I mean, I, yeah, you, we can talk about ages cause it is, su- that puts it into perspective in such a way. Um, I think it was Io Saba, not the real Io Saba, I don't think, but the, uh, the, the the social media personality that had a really good graphic that was put out this week that mm-hmm. like you could go back and track and everything. And like I've got I've got a, a brother that is 19 years old that's a freshman at K-State this year. Like he has only seen K-State lose to KU four times in his life. And they all happened before he was like the age of six. So mm-hmm. He has no recollection of that kind of thing happening. Uh, and, you know, it's obviously important to, to people that are much older than the three of us that remember it not being like that. And for, for it to get to this point, it's a, it's a significant deal. Uh, one of the first things that I want to hit on with how this played out last night is, you know, you, you mentioned Lance Leipold and just not being used to KU having a competent coach and all that. And like, that's the, the number one factor in all of this is you think about the hires they made. They never were, they were never really good hires. Like, honestly, I, I argue that the Turner Gill hire was probably the best hire they, in, in terms of practice of what they made during that stretch, it just, he was a bad, he was a bad fit. He wasn't ready for the power five level, but everybody after that, you could look at it and say, yeah, that seems like a pretty bad decision. Like Charlie Weiss was never good anywhere except for when he was floated into Notre Dame the first couple of seasons. And then, I mean, the, the David Beatty thing, like and you're taking the wide receivers coach from Texas A&M and you're like, yeah, well, recruiting, baby. It's like I'm, I would maybe try and figure something else out like that he's good at. And then we knew that the Les Miles thing was a disaster from day one. And this was the first one that's like, this is a legit hire. This is – Travis Goff put his head down and and made a real hire. It's what Gene Taylor did for Chris Kleiman. And it's not just that Lance Leipold's there, but it's the fact that he was able to establish a staff that has Andy Kotelnicki, who I mean, we talk about a lot. The, the quarterback success, it is not because of the quarterback. It is because of the offensive coordinator. And I think we saw that on full display last night, not because KU kept it close with Cole Ballard at quarterback, but because KU did what they did last night by confusing the hell out of the K-State defense with the Wildcat and all the pre-movement, the pre-snap movement that took place. K-State was confused. It took them a long time to adjust. And when they finally did, and you were forced to put it in Cole Ballard's hands, he wasn't able to make enough plays down the stretch. They're just He wasn't able to. <laughs> and he played, his, he played his butt off last night and did all he could. Um, but 
K-State took a long time to adjust, and I think that's the one thing that is getting overlooked in a pretty heavy manner by KU fans that are, you know, moral victoring this and uh, talking about, like, well, actually, you shouldn't celebrate your 15th straight win against this because, you know, you shouldn't have won that game. It's like, well, luck goes a couple different ways. And my theory on this is, and you guys can both tell me I'm wrong, I think if KU plays Jalen Daniels or Jason Bean in that game and it's a more of a traditional offense and look, it's probably what the spread before the game suggested, where it's probably a touchdown to a 10-point game. But K-State had a heck of a time trying to defend all of the little wrinkles that KU put into the game last night. And that is what gave KU the leg up to get up 27-16 early in the second half and why they were almost able to pull off this win. Yeah, I think you're absolutely right. I think uh, I, I, I think they game planned really well. I think they they put in way more. I mean, they always do pre snap movements, but mm -hmm. last night was on steroids. It was I mean, like every the, play. The number yeah. of and the number of and you know and, and that's the thing you also have to remember for on our side is is K State was without two of its arguably best or most important defensive players yep. at the middle linebacker spot to, to combat that. And you're throwing out dudes that are, are true freshmen to play linebacker against those kind of movements and shifts. That makes a huge difference as well. And I think KU took absolutely took advantage of that and that, give them credit for that. And Chris Kleiman said after the game, like, you know, talking about the true freshman situation, Austin Romain has been fine this year, really good for a true freshman, but he said after the game, like they had they had to go with Bo Palmer there because they had to go with experience in that situation. They needed that, and obviously it ended up having some impact and helping them out. The defense did settle down, and I mean, can you again after that opening touchdown in the second half to go up twenty seven to sixteen, and the defense ended up coming through and making some plays. Yeah, I mean, I, I agree. I mean, I, I can't remember who I was talking to after the game, uh, but I, I said something similar that if being would have started i think the game probably goes a lot differently because of how k would have called offense like it i've never seen so much wildcat and speed option in my entire life yeah it was just it was just something that k-state was you know was ill-equipped to handle for a majority of last night they finally settled in made enough plays and uh look i that game was the perfect uh, like kind of redemption story for K-State against good teams this year, where it was the same type of deal that happened against Missouri and Texas, and really more so the Missouri game, uh, even though they never got down that big in the Missouri game. But you go down, you score on that first drive of the game, big road environment, and you're thinking, oh, okay, all right, this this may not be as tight as we thought, or like this could this is going to be a good night. And then you get popped repeatedly, and you find yourself in a hole, and then eventually the defense settles down, plays well enough to give you a chance, and K-State finally took advantage of it in the game against KU by the offense converting and coming back and doing what they needed to do, something that they came short in in the last three losses against Missouri, Oklahoma State, and Texas. So I, I think that was a big, like, symbolic win for K-State, and you know now maybe – some of the people that are talking about how soft K State is and you know how they suck on the road can can chill out a little bit on that because you know I know Cole Ballard was at quarterback but like I've said that he's not the reason and Jalen Daniels and Jason Bean aren't the reason why the KU offense is so good and K State found a way last night to get a win against a top twenty five <laughs> team and a team that's been really good this season so uh, I I think that that was that was a big deal for the Cats. Yeah, I mean, I, I said it last night in our incident reaction that 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 is a culture win by K State. When things aren't going well and you're not playing very well, and you find a way to win, playing your C plus game, that that that's the sign of like the opposite of a soft team. Yeah, yeah. Here's this is going to be you know this stat is kind of funny, but uh, K State scored two point nine points per drive and KU scored three points per drive, so they actually had more points per drive in the game than we did. You know, because we created kind of the extra drive with the muff punt. That's only the seventh time in the last 200 games that K State has won a game like that. So, um, and it's twice in the climb. And we actually did that against Texas Tech in 2019. Uh, Makes out, sense. Outscored on points per drive and still win. So it's kind of a Bill Snyder thing, but 
percentage wise, that's like a 3.5% tile win uh, to win a game where you have uh, a, a fewer points per drive than your opponent. So it's, it's, you know, KU fans, that'll just encourage them to uh, say it was a fluke, but you know, sometimes you just got to find a way to win in case they did that. And you know, the, the luck factor in the game, uh, we talked about turnovers a lot going into it. And, you know, I guess I didn't give Casey enough credit last time. They, they really forced three turnovers with the muff punt, but you know, they, they avoided the big one. And I said this to Drew in the instant reaction afterwards, where we talked about how KU, they would victimize you if you made the big air, they would take advantage of it. And the difference maker in this game is absolutely 100% the drop pick six, because I think everybody in the stadium thought that it was going the other way. And I mean, I was down on the field and I, I'm behind the KU defense, so I'm only seeing the back. So I can only see the ball coming to me, not it in front of me once it's into the field of play. And I, I I didn't know when it had dropped. It felt like it took forever to fall to the ground, and then everybody realized, oh, that's incomplete. And that's the difference maker. Because if KU goes up there in that situation, what they'd make it 34 to 16, and it just it feels over. And that's that's a tough one to come back from. You're you're down three scores. You're gonna have to find a way. And so KU not getting that big defensive touchdown like we talked about and K-State being able to come through and force the big ones is a big deal. And really, it's two big special teams plays that save the, the face and reputation of special teams last night because they were really bad outside of the block PAT that they take back for two points and then the muff punt, which the muff punt comes because it wasn't a good punt really like Jack Bloomer. That was the worst game I've ever seen him have. And it, you know, short punt that KU you guys come up, try and feel around the 50 and it squirts out and uh, there's Ty Bowman falling on it. And uh, it was a big, big moment for K state and kind of funny that the last two years, really the difference maker and momentum in this game is K state getting a muff punt because K state came out, was forced to punt first series last year against KU and, they get the punt muffed, and uh, Malik Knoll scores on the next play. So it was it was a big deal, and uh, K State was able to win the turnover battle, even with a fumble that they should have had. That I mean, twenty seven yards. Yeah, the wildest fumble that I've ever seen take place in a game to get that many yards out of it. Uh, that was a bad luck situation for K State, yep. and they were still able to come out on the positive side of the turnover game. Yeah, I hope that 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 speech that that KU special teams coach gave must have been a, a heck of a speech for his guys to come out and look pretty much awful and make well, the two biggest I, mistakes of the game. They really, I I think those guys really took it to heart. They, uh, I that that's the kind of performance from uh if if you're in charge of a certain group or you oversee a certain group. That's maybe the one that makes you say, hey, maybe I should hang it up. Maybe this game has passed me by. Maybe I, I can't do this anymore. Uh, I don't know. Just me. Uh, but, you know, maybe maybe having to work in Lawrence, some of the stink rubs off on you and Sean Snyder isn't what he used to be. Or yeah. maybe or maybe it was just his dad the entire time. <laughs> you know, I'm reading I, part I, of I, the blocked PAT <laughs> with uh, Keenan Garver waving the weed afterwards. I, I missed that live. Yes. Yeah, no, that was very good. Uh, look, people are probably going to be upset that I'm taking shots at Sean Snyder. Uh, I've got no problem taking shots at Sean Snyder because uh, the the way that things were kind of handled always behind the scenes with K-State football uh, and, and how hard there was a push for him to have a bigger role than he needed. And now more so than ever, look, I, I don't care that the guy took a job at KU. Because you know, these guys are football coaches. They, they want to coach football. They'll do it wherever they get the chance. But I will always say this about this situation. For a family that has preached all along about how important the K-State family is to them, and if, if, you if you're Sean Snyder and you think that you have this big role in the history of K-State football, how do you not feel disgusting working for KU? And the, I, it's it's a total spite thing on his part to be there, and so I have I look I have no problem taking shots at Sean Snyder and working at KU and trying to help Lance Leipold. So that was a ha ha gotcha sucker moment last night, and uh, I'm I'm more than happy with how that played out uh, for uh, for the Cats. And look, Bill, you can go ahead and block me on Twitter. 
because I'm not giving out winners on Twitter. You have to watch the KSO <laughs> show on Fridays for that. So there you go. All right, uh, moving on, let's talk about some of the individual performances in the game. Offensively, probably the place to start is, is DJ Giddens. K-State had to rely on him like we thought. Now, it plays out a little bit differently, but he ran hard last night with a purpose, and obviously after the game, the most emotion we've probably ever seen from DJ <laughs> Giddens, uh, and it was it was happiness afterwards. So that was a guy that obviously that meant a lot to him last night, and and he played his butt off too. And so props to DJ Giddens for what he was able to accomplish yesterday for K-State. Yeah, I had him at – Charted at 19 carries, 105 yards, and a 68% success rate on the, his touches when he ran the ball, according to down and distance, five and a half yards of carry. So really effective runner. Um, I don't know. It seemed like maybe he was a little dinged up after he took that shot early in the game. And, you know, Treshawn Ward um, got a bunch of carries. You know, Treshawn Ward, I will, you know, he had the 52-yard run, which was huge. But that was his only successful run by down and distance yeah. during the game. He had uh, seven carries with a 14% success rate. But that 52-yard run was gigantic right after the near, near pick six. But <clears throat> DJ was definitely the most effective and efficient. Um, you know, KU did a good job in the second half taking away, you know, K-State's kind of power stretch game where we pull Gillum on the edge. And, and K-State did a good job adjusting and, and started running power and zone inside with them. But really effective game for him. Uh, I definitely think he would be the player of the game just because of his consistency run the ball, which case they needed in that game. Yeah. The, the thing about DJ too, which I didn't really understand at the time. And I'm still kind of struggling to understand it a little bit is that it felt like every time he went between the tackles, he was just pounding KU away. But when they try to go outside, there was nothing there. So it was it what was really impressive though was the, I think the first two runs kind of really set the tone of like this was gonna be DJ Giddens' game and like clear the way. And he ran hard and with a purpose and it was he runs hard always, but I think that might that might be the hardest that he's ran all season. I would agree with that. I mean, I, I, he, because he, he had a he had a legitimately work for it last night. I mean, that's the thing. I, I discounted the KU defense all season, and I still thought you'd be able to to run against them. They made it a lot tougher than I thought last night in that game. Now, part of that just ends up working out because uh, K State's defense was just giving it at will. It's the same type of deal that happened in the in the Texas game. Basically, you get down in a situation early where. And, you know, you can't always rely on the run. It changes up a lot of things, but uh, I don't know. I, I thought he played well. Now, Will Howard, on the other hand, uh, I think that he was probably the second most important offensive player last night. The numbers don't look overly impressive, but if you're objective and you still don't hate Will Howard, um, I know that that is a novel concept for a lot of people out there. Um, I mean, it. I, I, yeah, we don't have to dive into it because I, I like Will Howard and I like Avery Johnson. You can like both guys. You can think that both guys are good yes. players and talented. Uh, you don't have to pick a side and, and Thank go from you, there. Mason. I mean, I, I, I just at no point in that game last night did I sit there thinking, you know what would make this go better for K-State is if Avery Johnson was in the game. Will Howard was never the problem last night for K-State. And I thought he came through. He made some great throws and – you know, like I said, the numbers don't look overly impressive, but the the actual eye examination, he did a lot of things to help K-State win that game, and he showcased how smart he is and how much he's grown from year one and really year two to year three and four. And we, we really have gotten to a point now where we are seeing the Will Howard that we thought we would get all season long heading into 2023. Yeah, I... He, he made plays when he needed to, you know, he made some mistakes obviously. Mm -hmm. And and I think he'd even, he'd say that too, but he made plays when he needed to. There's some big throws in the game. The first drive, he was fantastic. Um, he made some other big throws that 29 yarder to Jace Brown, which was really a nice play call. Um, Cause they'd been running crossing routes all day. And then they, you know, circle him back out faking the crossing route, which was a nice scheme. Um, and then he, you know, at the end, he, he made a, a few nice runs, when we needed to run, I think he seemed like he was a little banged up. He seemed kind of gimpy out there, but 
you know, the, the big read on the 15 yard touchdown run was huge as well. Um, so he was effective when he needed to be and, and did enough in the passing game, even though the passing game wasn't great. He did enough <clears throat> when he needed to <clears throat> then made the big throw late to Philip Brooks, which was close to not being a completion, but we'll take it. Yeah. I mean, it was Will Howard's game kind of just symbolic of the, the whole game in general. Like it, it wasn't always pretty. It the numbers don't look great, but he did just enough, and and I think that that's kind of like the the big story here is that K State is probably the second best team in the Big Twelve because they can play their C game and go on the road in Lawrence and win, and that, that's a very good KU team that they just beat, and they didn't and K State didn't play particularly well, which. I mean, Mason and I, we talked about this on the way back to our cars uh, last night, but that, that kind of makes the Oklahoma State game more frustrating yeah. that that K-State played their C game <laughs> then, and it happened to be a game where Oklahoma State played probably their A game, maybe B plus, A minus game, it, and they lost because that, that that's probably going to be what keeps them out of the Big 12 championship. Yeah, I mean, Drew, you'll like me saying this. There were a lot of situations this this year <laughs> where uh, K-State could have played a much worse game and won. And the Oklahoma State game, it was just the perfect storm of, like, wrong timing and for that game to happen. And last night against KU, it, it was not their best game. It was not anywhere close to their best game and performance. But it did showcase what they could do. And it's just the scheduling math is going to work against K-State this year and how things ended up working out. And I mean, at the end of the day, you think about it. K State's three toughest league games they played this season were on the all on the road. That's that is tough to overcome. And you think if this was like regular old Big Twelve, yes, you still would have had to go to Kansas, to Oklahoma State, to Texas this year. But you would have also gotten Oklahoma at home, and you would have gotten some of these opportunities. Um, and the schedule would have maybe played out a little bit differently. It just it was unfortunate for them. They they played bad in, in moments in those games and put themselves in holes they couldn't overcome. And last night we saw what this team could be. And that's I think when we, we talk about this season and look at it now, it's gonna be really frustrating because all three of the losses that K State took this season very easily could have been wins. Um and, I mean, especially the Missouri and Texas games when you lose by three points in those and you had legitimate chances to win the game. Oklahoma State, I give them credit for having an opportunity at the end to tie it and force overtime, but they never deserved to win that game. They played well enough in spurts against Missouri and Texas to win that game. Um, so last night was, like I said earlier, about just kind of them coming back. It, it, was, it was good for them to get over the hump and get a win that they ultimately kind of deserved in a game like that because they were good enough to win those games. They just – fell on the other side of it and uh last night they ended up on the right side and and yeah you got some some very fortuitous bounces and and plays or whatever but i would also go out to say that like so did KU in that game we talk about the fumble that was a big deal chris Kleiman, that was the hottest i had ever seen him uh he worked an official after the the will howard interception for the longest time because they wanted i think it was ben senet that got either grabbed or pushed or something in the process. And he was livid. Connor Riley was giving it to that official too. Like I was shocked that they didn't get flagged. Uh, honestly, the, they, I mean, they rode him for a long time, but, and that was the thing. KU is a very grabby team. Um, yes. you, you could make an argument that the pass interference and holding calls that they got last night were not adequate enough for what they, they do at times. And, um, so, look, everybody gets lucky in games. It's just about if it evens out. I think it evened out last night because at the end of the day, the better team won the football game last night. And K-State's the better football team, whether Jalen Daniels, Jason Bean, or Cole Ballard, or Tory Lachlan is is playing quarterback. <laughs> K-State is the better football team. They didn't, they didn't play like it last night for a lot of the game, but at the end of the day, they did it on the scoreboard, and that proved it, and uh, they came through because – I mean, similar to Oklahoma State, KU probably played about as good of a game as they could have last night. You know, because, and you think about when the interceptions came, 
what one was on like a third and long. And so they were going to have to punt anyways. And then the other was on a fourth down that they were having to go for it. So, okay, that pass gets batted down. It's not a pick, like whatever. The turnovers were inconsequential for KU in that game last night, especially since K-State came out and wasn't Will's interception right after they had gotten yeah. a from Kobe Savage. So, yeah, like it, 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 it all worked out. I, I don't need to defend it anymore. Um, we, we always talk about cause for concern on the Sunday show. And is there any cause for concern on this defense? I know there's only two games left. Only one of them in some people's minds matters because it's Iowa State and then a bowl game. Um, but should we be worried at all about Joe Klanderman and how long it took to get adjusted to this or anything about last night's defensive showing that it was heart-stopping at times? Um, I, I mean, I think that I'd be a little bit worried just about the linebacker situation, and that that's strictly just because of how young and inexperienced uh, some of the guys playing are are now, and even like depth wise, like I haven't fully looked at uh, the PFF snap counts, but I think Austin or Austin Moore and Desmond Purnell played the whole game. It's like I, that that's a little concerning going forward. But I mean, other than that, I mean, I I don't think that K State will play a team that is structured kind of how KU is offensively in the bowl game, and Iowa State's not really like that. So I'm not fully concerned yet. Yeah, <clears throat> yeah, I think Drew's right. <clears throat> the matchup matters, and um, Iowa State is not going to do the same kind of shifting and, and movement that that KU did. And Andrew's right. Probably in the bowl game, you're not going to see that as well. So um, that does make a difference. But I do think linebacker depth is an issue, and uh, they probably will make a mistake or two against Iowa State even in that game mm -hmm. too. So um, it's not you're not completely out of the woods with that, but um, it's going to be a different look against Iowa State than we saw this week. And the Iowa State run game. I know they didn't have a great day on the ground against Texas yesterday, but really nobody has this season is starting to get some things figured out. Uh, they, they've they've started to, to move in a good direction, and a lot of that has to do with, you know, Abu Sama, the freshman that they have. He yeah. had an awesome game against BYU. Uh, and in addition to that, I mean, they have plenty of other running backs that can get the job done against you. So uh, Iowa State will be a tough matchup from that. And, I, I mean, if Matt Campbell is the coach that people made him out to be three years ago, uh, Iowa State will come into that game in Manhattan <coughs> – with at least some looks similar to what KU did this week because Casey had a tough time adjusting. And while they'll probably be better equipped if they see it again, it's still not something that you feel great about moving forward for them. So we'll see. Uh, and real quick, fact check for you, Drew. Uh, Austin Moore only missed one play in the game. Des Purnell only missed two. There were two guys that played every single snap for K-State on defense yesterday, though. Uh, I'll say that it was Siegel and Savage. Yep, Siegel and Savage. So there you go. My man Marquis Siegel finally came down with one that counted. How about it? But, but, but he also could have let it go because it was fourth down. Yeah, but, you know, wh why do that? Big momentum play. I like hearing the KUPA guy say that the pass was intercepted. I also liked hearing him say that uh, the, the two-point conversion attempt is correct last night after Will Howard <laughs> ran it in. <laughs> That was that was a pretty good. Also, real quick, you know, say something nice about KU and your rival. I I actually really like the KU PA guy. I think he's got like an awesome voice and cadence for that. And I've always thought that. I I have always liked the KU PA guy. So props was that to him. Shot that Mitch there. No, no. I, I, look, I, you know me. I love Mitch too. I love Mitch too. I'm not saying uh, Mitch is great at it. I mean. If I, you know, I, I'm not going to get into it. I was going to say, I'm going to power rank K-State PA guys <laughs> in my lifetime. Uh, uh -oh, but, uh -oh. you know, I worked with two of them and both of them were really good to me. Uh, so I, I'm not going to, you know, well, I'm going to tell you this. Dave Lewis and Mitch Fortner, they are tied for first place in my K-State PA rankings because I'm not old enough to rem re really remember anybody before Dave. Uh, so that's, uh, that's, that's fine there. But yeah, KU PA guy. Shout out to him. I thought I was going to have one other nice thing to say about KU. So, you know, the angry mob didn't come after me, but I, I I can't even remember what that was at this point. 
Um, so I'll just take a shot at him and say that KU's in eighth place in the Big 12 right now with one game to play in the season. So that's why the Independence Bowl was there. As as often as you know things change, a lot of things still stay the same. And uh, KU is an eighth place team in a really bad Big 12 conference this year. Like this league sucks. So I couldn't imagine being the eighth place team in such a crappy league. Uh. <laughs> kind of embarrassing if you ask me uh, uh fraud fraud watch might get updated and we might have lance peeking through i don't know uh that's that's a joke i respect lance leipold i i respect him he's a great coach whatever uh but you know just something to keep in mind so uh all right well fan i know you got to get out of here we will uh let you go drew and i will continue the party for just a little bit longer and uh kind of keep things rolling. Uh, any final thoughts on the win over KU from K-State? Yeah, I would just say um, <clears throat> don't begrudge the win. I think there's some K-State fans. Um, I know the Twitter and the message boards were melting down, especially in the first half, and it was not a good look. Um, and I get it. P fans, the reactionary nature of fans combined with social media and message boards is, is not always a good combo. And people end up probably saying things they maybe shouldn't or regret later. Um, but I, I do enjoy the passion of our fans. And I, and, I, and I get that we have dominated KU so long that it's easy to get caught up in expecting that domination every week. Uh, but this, this was a good win. It's going to be an eight win, probably more than likely an eight win KU team, their best team since 2008 for sure. So uh, we went to their place. We beat them. They had the full crowd. Uh, they may have had a third string quarterback. We've talked about uh, their OC and their system is so good that really, um, as long as that quarterback has time in that system, they're probably going to be pretty effective. And K State did what it needed to do to win. And now we get Farmageddon to to get to nine wins and uh, hopefully go into a pretty good bowl game in in December. Uh, real real quick, the final final question for you. Uh, is that a top, like since the streak started, is that one of the, the two or three, like, I, I, I don't know if the phrase would be best or most <laughs> enjoyable, at least like in retrospective, like you're really going to enjoy that one over some of the others. Like what are your favorites? Yeah. If, if you, if you look at close game wins, my favorites probably still, and you, you guys weren't born yet, but 92, uh, <laughs> 93, when they came back and won 16 to 12, um, that was a, that was in high school at that, at that one. So that, that one was significant. Um, and then there were a few bills that, you know, once bill got rolling, we weren't very close very often against yeah. KU, which was, which was fun. Um, Bill's first one in 2.0 when in seventeen ten was pretty significant. That was a close game. And uh, this would be, you know, <clears throat> I would say the second close, second best close game win behind that, that 16 to 12 win. Yeah, I say this not to take a shot at Chris Kleiman and K-State last night, but it is very funny to to, to say to KU people, K-State played like absolute shit last night and came back from down 11 in the second half in Lawrence and the best crowd that building has seen in a lot of people's lifetimes and you still couldn't beat them. So yep. pretty enjoyable. We, cl we closed out the booth with the yep. style. Yep. All right, we'll see you, fan. Take it easy, guys. See ya. All right. Well, there you go. Uh, now just Drew and I left hanging about, getting uh, things rolling on here. Uh, anything else from the game last night that needs to be mentioned before we, we move into uh, some of the bigger picture things and then uh, the Big 12 as a whole? Uh, I mean, I, I mean, uh, like, I feel like we hit on a lot of stuff in the instant reaction show because I was going to say, like, Last night's last drive of the game was a legacy drive for the KC offensive line to really just close it out. And, like, I mean, you can chime in on this, too. I, I can't remember the last time that k had the ball with, like, five minutes and change to go in the game and close the game out on offense in a close game. I mean, the way they did it last night, like, I don't know that we've seen it to that extent. That was a lot of time. It was... I, I I was short changing it last night. I said like five twenty. It was five thirty three on the clock, and KU had all three timeouts, and K State was able to not give the ball back. And they were, I mean, they started the twenty yard line, and they were impressive. And they they had to throw the ball one time, and it was it was good enough, good enough to hold up on replay. 
Um, I got really concerned. I was getting texts from people left and right saying that that was a catch. It wasn't a catch. It's going to, I had no idea what was about to happen. Um, there was probably some premature celebration from myself and Zach Carlson. We gave it, it wasn't like outwardly, but it was like facial expressions. Like when it happened, we're like, Oh, okay. Woo, woo, woo. And then no, <laughs> no, we had a, we kind of had to hold our breath there, but uh, yeah, that was that was honestly the most impressive thing last night. And I thought the I thought the offensive line really in general. I've been I've been really negative to them at points this season. I'm sure a lot of people are like, yeah, you have. You've been a hater. Um, if you go and look last night, like the early PFF grades, uh, three of the the top five or three of the top four grades go to offensive linemen. It's well deserved. Carver Willis, Cooper Beebe, and Hayden Gillum in that group. Um, they they played their butts off and. They did things at the end of the game that you absolutely needed to win, and uh, I, props to them because they've had they've had a down season compared to what the expectation was. And I've been highly critical of of a lot of those guys, but they came through last night. It was a significant deal, um, so good for them. And then just you know, Will Howard continuing to even as people continue to find ways to be negative as he's the quarterback of an eight and three team at K State right now. Um, and one touchdown away for the tying the record. Yeah, he he has come through, and last night he was a big part of that too. Knowing how to operate, not being worried about that moment, and I think that there were a lot of people that were like, "When does Will Howard ever come through in this moment for us?" Um, I know that that was something that was said directly to me by somebody last night, and I just said, "Like, well, look, it, maybe it hasn't been in this, you know, late game closing situation or whatever, or one of these, you know." pivotal spots that you think of in the second half but like you got to remember that throw he made to rj garcia in the big 12 championship was big time i don't care when it happened in the game that was such a big deal for momentum and that was the holy crap they're gonna do this thing moment in that game and i know tcu came back and forced overtime but that was that was a big time deal and he has come through in other moments i mean Really, he came through for him against Texas, and people aren't going to give him credit, but the offensive line failed him in overtime there. He put them in position. Sure, maybe he could have made one one different decision. I think it's tough given what the play calls were. And yeah, he had some misses last night, some bad misses at times. But on one of them that people are killing him for, they still scored a touchdown on that drive. So I, I, I think that the heat on Will Howard needs to cool off quite a bit. Because it's gotten to a ridiculous level, and he he is one of the main reasons why K State was able to win that football game last night and keep the streak alive at fifteen. Um, and I really wasn't planning on turning this into another like you know, screw you for not being nice to Will Howard thing. That's not what I'm I'm doing. But I just the more I think about it, like I I was impressed by what he was able to do last night. He came through for K State when they needed him, and that's all you can really ask of your quarterback um, because. Like, I'll be honest, as much as I, I'm not like a down guy on Will Howard anymore, and I've been transparent about the first two years, I, I was very down and I had, I, I was very nasty to him. I compared him to Carson Wentz, and uh, that's the lowest compliment you can give a quarterback. I can say it's not even a compliment, it's the, it's the biggest <laughs> dig you can give to a quarterback, at least in my eyes, because Carson Wentz is a fraud. But he's turned it around, and it would, it would not have been great for his legacy and his resume if, he ended it with a loss to KU. They just wanted to have been good. And uh, I would I, I would have felt even a little sour about it where, you know, even if he goes on to break the single season record and he's the all-time, it's like, man, but he lost to KU in his last last chance against them, we think. And that, that wouldn't have been great. So he put it together. Um, and I, I think, you know, one of the things that I appreciate about Chris Kleiman and his staff since coming over is that the – the, the amount of effort and care that they have and put into this game with KU has not dropped off since Bill Snyder was at K-State. And that was the number one thing that you couldn't have happen. Like, that's it's why KU fell off so hard. Like, they brought in guys that they didn't give a crap about that game. And, you know, really you can say that their recruiting still shows that they don't really give a crap about that game. Um, and, you know, they need to improve in that area. But – Chris Kleiman understands that it's important to the fans and it's important for getting players that win the game for them. I mean, you think about the players of the game you had in the three phases yesterday were all Kansas kids. And you think about the guy that we expect is going to 
continue the streak to get wins 16, 17, and 18 in Avery Johnson, that is a Kansas kid. You think if, if Chris Kleiman and this staff wasn't putting an emphasis on that game and they were losing to KU and they weren't as good as they, they had been, you think he's at K-State? I doubt it. So that emphasis is a big deal, and you're getting the players in the margins. I mean, think about the the kids from Lawrence that have been on this K-State football team since Chris Kleiman has been here that have been impactful players and made plays for you. And y- y- that doesn't happen if K-State's not dominant over KU. And I know a lot of their experience is from Snyder doing it, so props to Bill Snyder because he deserves it. But Chris Kleiman deserves a lot of praise for not letting the ball drop since he's taken over in this rivalry. Yeah, I mean, it's legitimately wild still to me that you go through this now and K-State has double the amount of Kansas kids on the roster that KU does. And I mean, you talked about the Keenan Garber and Echo Boydo, Lawrence kids, Nate Matlack, Olatha to Keenan Garber uh, with the blocked extra point. Yeah, I mean, it, it. it's like every time you look down, you're like, oh, there's another Kansas kid making a play in this game. It, it's why I made the joke uh, to you that it was funny to me that KU doesn't have a lot of Kansas kids and, you know, it's not a rivalry, but they made Devin Neal and Mason Fairchild, their poster guys uh, on the program for last night's game as, yeah. as their two best ki- kids from Kansas. It's like the game means a lot in state and it's good to see that that has never dropped off. I mean, we all saw after the game last night, Taylor Bratt running around with the governor's cup, which was a fun time. Like it, the game means a lot in state and I, I'll, I'll go, I'll say something nice about the rivalry and then say something negative about K and take shots. <laughs> uh, last night, like when I got home, I, I said like, that was what college football is about. Mm-hmm. It was two teams that were really good playing in a great environment and just battling it out. And it was a coin flip game and it happened. It just so happened that K-State won. Uh, my, my shot is that uh, Mike Lee is kind of a word that I shouldn't say on this show for deleting his tweet, making fun of K-State as somebody that was 8-36 hmm. and 0-4 and and against KU. And, hey, against would, K-State well, this time. was the word you were going to use, the word that he used to describe K-State as purple whatever? Yes. Interesting. Yeah. Mike Lee, that is a that is a strange, strange deal because, it, you know, half the hits that they view as like big hits. Well, one of them like was Alex Barnes kicking him in the face. And like, I, I don't know that uh, Mike Lee is a, a weird dude. All those all those KU guys are weird dudes, especially the ones that played on those teams. Like too many Christmas. If you're if I you're still if you're still giving moral victories for the 2018 game, uh that's that's more embarrassing than giving moral victories from last night's game. Like, gee, many Christmas. Yeah, c- congrats. You you almost beat Alex Delton in a five and seven K State team that year. Like, what? It's, uh, you're an I'll idiot. give you a, a Mike Lee fun fact. Uh, Philip Brooks wins over KU six. Mike Lee total <laughs> wins in college eight. <laughs> well, there you go, Philly B, the 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 KU killer. <laughs> Uh, right there that's uh that's pretty impressive yeah i just that's one of those that i i don't i don't understand and everything else and uh you know i i it brought me great joy in seeing that uh they're like honorary jayhawk or whatever raising the flag last night uh was a a you know fellow 620 hutchinson native ben heaney and uh you know ben heaney went to hutch so not not my kind of guy uh, cause you know, we're, we're crusaders and, uh, you know, if you're, you're from Hutch and go to Bueller, that's the way you want it to be. And, uh, shout out to him. You know, he never, he never beat K state. And I don't know that this had anything to do with it afterwards, but I heard him talking in the press box when I was uploading the press conference video. Uh, they were trying to clean out like suites and like different rooms up there and everything. And there was one of them, there was somebody who was like, well, I, well, Ben Heaney's still in there. And this was like, well after the game ended, like over an hour after the game had ended. And I was in my head, I just took that and pictured that as like he's so like upset and like broken up about this game in there. Um I was I had an irrational moment. What was that his Stefan Diggs moment? That was his Stefan Diggs moment. 
You know, it's weird. KU football's had a lot of Stephon Diggs moments recently. Uh, and just like Stephon Diggs, they have not done jack shit since that <laughs> Stephon Diggs moment. They have just continued to lose. Uh, maybe, you know, yeah. So I, I that's very funny to me, uh, the way that worked out. And look, I, I was an irrational Ben Heaney hater. I'm sure the other people from Hush were like, oh, he was a, he was a good kid and blah, 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 all this other stuff. Uh, I do not care. Uh, I did not like Ben, ben Heaney <laughs> because he went to Hutch because I went to Bueller and I did not like him because he was a KU linebacker that was actually pretty good and that made it fun. Um, but it, I, it, I took great joy in that, you know. S some of us from Hutch got to experience a win last night and don't know what it's really like to lose this game. Uh, that guy, all he does is lose that game. So starting a personal rivalry with a guy that played in the NFL, <laughs> probably not my best choice. Uh, but you know, it's a rivalry. This is what it's about. Everybody, everybody peacocks in a rivalry game with people that, you know, they, they wouldn't ever do anything, you know, in any other world to, uh, it's just a war of words, uh, at the end of the day. So maybe your day will be coming soon. Well, we'll have to see, we'll have to figure it out and see, uh, <laughs> What ends up happening? All right, let's uh, let's roll on here. We've had enough fun with this. Unless you have any final shots that you want to get out at KU, um, anything uh, else left? You're kind of stupid if you're gonna bring out the QB excuse because it, it's it's they're just using it as a as a crotch. Like you know that K State would have been made fun of so hard by them if they would have won that game. Mm -hmm. So like you you can't be like oh third string quarterback well it, would you have said the same thing if if KU would have won no yeah no exactly uh, it's it's you know it is what it is everybody has their their thing and they they you know whatever um, but it was good and I I will I will say this you know I've said this to multiple people I do not feel uh, bad in saying it because I believe it to be true and. Uh, that's, it's totally fine with me because I, 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 that's how much I, I enjoy this rivalry and everything else, uh, and how confident and, and, and passionate I am about where I went to school and how much I, I think it's a great representation of me and, and anybody else that went there. Um, there, there is a legit arrogance that comes from KU people. And I, I say to people constantly, I can, I can count on less than my 10 fingers, people that I know that actually went to KU that I, I enjoy their presence. Um, you know, traditionally they are just not great people, uh, at least socially to interact with. I'm sure they're fine, you know, to other people and they're, they're nice humans, but they're not people that I really ever want to associate with. You know, I've, I've got, I've got my cousins. I love them. They're great KU fans. I will, I, you know, props to them, uh, you know, a couple of others, but a lot of the people that I knew that grew up KU fans, you know what they didn't do? They didn't go to KU. They went somewhere else, and uh, they didn't get the you know the Campanile stink on them walking through there as a as a graduate. Something happens when you walk through the Campanile on graduation day, and you just become uh, a miserable person to deal with. So that's there you go. That's my that's me diving into the weeds of the rivalry, and uh, I'm sure a, plenty of people are upset and offended by that. I really do not care because the Cats have won 15 straight. K State owns the state. It is a glorious time, and what? Let's count them up. I mean, in the time that this streak has been going for K State now, how many basketball games has K State won against K State? Like, there's no doubt. KU, yes, you are awesome at basketball. You are a national power at that. You are great. You kick K State's butt almost every single time. But K State has actually won that basketball game, you know, a steady amount of times now in in the last, you know, over the last 15 years. So. What's the what's what's the thought process there? That's what I would uh, would go out there to to say and point out that since this streak has gone on, K State has has actually you know been competitive in those games. You know, there's been a lot more competitive basketball games than there have been competitive football games, um, and and that even includes the fact that basically every game in Allen Fieldhouse is never competitive. So, and that's a, that's a, that's a credit to KU right there. Uh, I will say the one other thing, and I mentioned it earlier, but I'll I'll make a point of it. I saw two games in David Booth Memorial Stadium this year. The crowds were awesome for both of them. And that that is something that I'm with fan. Like I the blowouts keep them coming. I want those. <laughs> but it is fun to have 
when you're on the road. I mean, I, I enjoyed seeing, you know, it over half full with purple a lot of years, but it's also fun to be in a hostile crowd and environment like that and see K-State come out and get the victory uh, and overcome that and also just be able to silence a lot of people and watch tons of people file out of there as K-State's milking the clock away. So that's that's another thing that I, I will give props to, to KU on, and all that is a credit to Lance Leipold and what he's done there. So um, I'll be – look, I, there's still as much emo on me as ever. Uh, I will always try to be very subjective and unbiased with my opinion, but I'm also never going to be shy about the fact that I went to K-State. I love K-State. I want K-State to succeed in everything because, as I said earlier, it's a representation of me. It's a representation of you. It, representation of everybody that that ever went to K-State. And I will always be be proud of that. There's no reason for me to hide it and try to act like it's not something that's a part of me and that you know I, I'm not associated with it. I think that happens too many times in sports where people, especially in the media, like you try to disassociate uh, and you know you try to be this neutral down the middle type of thing. Um, that's where the opinions need to come from, but you can still be proud of where where you're from and w- what is important to you. And that's that's what I'll always have about K State. So I I enjoyed seeing the people file out of there early and and everything else because uh, that was that was a really fun game to look back on and see K State get the win. Like I said, in the moment, not very fun, pretty miserable. Uh, but afterwards and driving home last night, I thought I was going to be dead dog tired and probably like, you know, I was rumble stripping half the drive and it was just, you know, boom, 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 boom. I would have still been vibrating when I got home from as many times as I would have been on there. No, I was, I was wired. I had not an ounce of tiredness in my body driving home last night. So yeah, uh, it, it took me a while to fall back or to fall asleep when I got home too. Yeah. So that's good. Now all that matters, K-State's got to close it out with Iowa State, finish strong, get that win because Cyclones have proven that they can still be a frisky team. I mean, they losing 26 to 16 last night to Texas um, isn't, you know, any, any very you know, like unimpressive feat like that. That's something to, to take note of. So uh, credit to them there. And I guess that's a good way to kind of dive into uh, what happened in the Big 12 this week with our college football outsider. There is a look at the Big 12 scoreboard. From week 12, one one week left, BYU, they fought, had opportunities to beat Oklahoma and help K-State out. They came up just short. Houston, same type of deal. The Cougars were in what looked like really good position to maybe go out and get that thing done, and they squandered a two-score lead early in that game. Uh, they just threw a really miserable interception because uh, they were leading, uh, let's see, what were they up? 23 to nine at one point in that game. Um, and they just kind of broke down and Oklahoma state ran away. Ollie Gordon returned to form. So that unfortunate, the way that those games played out yesterday and then West Virginia killed Cincinnati. It was never close TCU. They got a game from Baylor early on, but then that one ended up being a blowout. Like we expected tech and UCF battling for bowl eligibility uh, two teams that have had similar seasons where they've kind of rebounded late. Um, it ended in a perfect way. I mean, Tech was back and forth, and then UCF missed a PAT. I think it got blocked, and uh, they ended up losing 24-23, and then Texas and Iowa State. So uh, real quick before we dive into it uh, in terms of games and breakdowns, um, the one thing to take note of is that uh, – for K-State to get to the Big 12 title game, they either need Texas to lose next week, which they are at home against Texas Tech on Friday night, or they need K-State needs both Oklahoma and Oklahoma State to lose home games as well. Oklahoma at home against TCU, Oklahoma State at home against BYU. So the likelihood of K-State uh, getting into the Big 12 title game, it's it's minimal at this point in time. Yeah, I mean it. It, it sucks because this was probably the week that it needed to happen with Texas, Oklahoma State, and Oklahoma all playing on the road. Yeah. But it, it's kind of like you look at it like nine and three and seven and two and not going to Arlington. That's that's just bad luck. So yeah, especially it, since that's seven and two is going to be what the teams that go are. 
Um, so it's just, you know, the, the schedule math didn't work out in your favor. Uh, and, and that's, that's unfortunate. Yeah. And, uh, I mean, diving into games, shout out to Texas tech for going bowling. Yeah. yeah that's good because UCF is probably going to go bowling now too, because mm-hmm. they have Houston at home. Uh, your boy, Dave Aranda, does he last another year if they go three and nine? I mean, it, I mean, it, it is bad. I, th- I think that they he probably gets one more year, but in reality, they shouldn't give him one more year. We know that he's not going to be good there. Like this is, it's not going to happen. But you know, it, it is whatever. I mean, yeah, the Big Twelve is looking right now, um, in in the position that they are in. So they've got seventeen. Or actually, they've got they have more teams than you'd think that are actually bowl eligible right now. They have eight teams that are bowl eligible. Um, the top eight teams in the league are all bowl eligible right now. And then TCU, uh, BYU, U- and UCF all have the chance to get there next week. But UCF seems like the likely winner at home against Houston. BYU and TCU, tough road games. It's probably not going to happen for them. Uh, but if the Big 12 ends up getting nine in this year, uh, that's that's a pretty good number still in a 14-team league where you had some very – Clearly, like we knew that four teams absolutely sucked in this league this year, and those are those are the four plus one that aren't going to go to a bowl game. That you know is is yeah. totally fine. It, in a just an, an oddity of the league uh, last night. How about K State and Texas both blocking an extra point and returning it for two? Oh, how about that? I, I want to know the, the odds of that happening before last night yeah that is impressive that's uh, uh, a good little one to throw out there west virginia i still think is bad but they're seven and four so and I, I gonna be eight and four yeah i don't really know what to make of their entire season well what and what's crazy is west virginia they won the first couple in close games uh in, in conference play but since then, their wins, they have won by two scores or more. They beat UCF 41-28. to They dominated that game. They killed BYU 37-7, to and they just blew out Cincinnati. So they have taken full advantage of the schedule that they were handed this season, uh, and even you know a little less because they, they could have beaten Houston and made the – I mean, think if we're talking about West Virginia being a nine-win team this year. It's just unreal. And that's with they had to play a non-con game at Penn State. So if they had had anybody else, like if they had played Pitt again this year or something, or wait, I think they did. They, they played did, them at they home. Did yeah, play they that. played them twice. So if you found a, a Pitt equivalent to replace her, or you just played a group of five school, like it's a wild season uh, that you know Neil Brown has put out there to save his job and continue with Chris Kleiman, uh, looking like they'll be employed by the, the schools that hired them after the 2018 season. A, a weird season for West Virginia where they're going to be eight and four, but might only have one win over a team with a winning record. Well, that's a, you know, Baylor went six and six last year like that. <laughs> uh, yeah. But West Virginia getting to eight and four with that, that's uh you're, you know, you worked out a pretty fortunate scheduling situation. Uh, if you are the Mountaineers, um, I really, there's not many other grandiose thoughts from the big 12 yesterday, at least for me not i mean k-state ku was a great game so was ou byu nothing else was really all that fun to watch um and we're at the point now where everything is mostly decided and you look ahead to next week and what's on you know the docket for the big 12 um it's you know k-state iowa state will be interesting seven o'clock on fox but all the other games really are not going to be entertaining i mean we're looking at what could probably end up being double digit spreads in OU TCU, Texas Texas Tech, Oklahoma State BYU um and that maybe KU Cincinnati but it's a road game. KU and West Virginia are both on the road about at bad opponents next week. So maybe that prevents it from being a bigger spread. I was but, say if, those, if those were flipped, that would those would both be double digit spreads too. Yeah. And then as you mentioned the other games UCF Houston, so you know whatever uh it's it's a good weekend to watch a bunch of other games in college football and k-state will have the k-state will know by friday night if they can go to the big 12 title game or not because 
you either need Texas or Oklahoma to lose on Friday to have any life going into Saturday for your chance to go to the Big 12 title game. Um, so that will be good. You'll have some finality, you would think. And certainly by the time you kick off against Iowa State, because Oklahoma State plays at 2.30. So, you know, we'll, we'll see how it plays out. I'm not counting on it right now. It's unfortunate because I think a lot of people, um, wherever you're at, would look at it and say K-State's the second best team in the Big 12. Just unfortunately, if you drop the ball in a couple games, you're going to get burnt by it. And K-State got burnt by it this year. And that's just, you know, how it goes. So. We'll see. Yeah. They'll have to get back on the horse for next year. Not not Big 12 related, but I, I want to give a shout out to Troy. Troy's on eight in a row, nine and two. Yeah. Until last night, I kept saying Troy was the best win K State had all season. So yeah, I still think Troy might be. Uh, I wouldn't go that far. I would not go that far. I think I think KU is is the best win. Right. Now maybe the fashion in which K State did it, because K State beat them yeah, 42 to 13. The fashion. Yeah, the fashion in which they did it probably makes it the best one that they've had all year because I mean James Madison only beat Troy by two. Yeah, uh, Troy they should be ten and two because they're going to play Southern Miss next week and Southern Miss is terrible despite the fact that they went on the road and they battled with Mississippi State for a while last night. Uh, <laughs> it was it probably not the the most fun game for Mississippi State fans, but I don't think they've had a fun season. So, I was gonna say I don't, I don't think their whole season has been very fun. So yeah, Troy Troy's probably gonna be the Sun Belt favorite too because yeah. they're probably gonna have to play App State. So yeah, it'll be uh, it'll be interesting to see. But all right, uh, any final thoughts before we uh, we have our one question for the coming week for K State? Um, I mean, the rivalry week next week is kind of bizarre when you look at the games. Yeah, West Virginia Baylor doesn't make a whole lot of sense. No, that's that's my rivalry. KU Cincinnati somehow makes less sense. So like n- next year, the last week of the season, if they're gonna do this rivalry week thing, that it probably needs to go back to KU K State the last week of the regular season. Oh, so are you saying that Farmageddon's not a real rivalry? Oh, if I were getting real rivalry, but I feel like it would make more sense to make it KUK State that way or give KU like Oklahoma State or just KU Cincinnati doesn't really do a whole lot for me. Well, I think I think what it should probably go to is I, I like K-State KU being played in like October, uh, kind of that, you know, it, October, like 11 a.m. 230 kick is like perfect for K-State KU, like make it one of those type of deals. I think the thing that you try and be, make a regular experience. Now, the thing that the Big 12 is going to struggle with is you only have like, what, three matchups that are going to be played every single year. Yeah. So you don't have really this like whatever true rivalry system you can do. But like K-State Colorado, I think would be a good one to play at the end of every year uh, to establish and have like old Big 8 opponents play each other. So like KU Iowa State would be one. Um, I know Iowa State. Well, the fans would want K State. Jamie Pollard w- would tell them to screw off. It's not a rivalry because you don't buy tickets to the game, losers. Uh, so I don't know what to make of that one, but I think that there's a way to do it. And I do think that you have to put the former Big Eight schools that are in the league together. Uh, and and you'll already have some of that history there, and you can build a bigger and better rivalry experience off of that. That would be what my preference would be. So, I, I mean, I think K-State in Boulder next year to finish the season, uh, the weather would suck, but it would be a pretty fun environment and a, a big thing to look forward to. Yeah, like you could do old big eights and like you'd have, you could have a uh, BYU-Utah last week mm-hmm. of the regular season too, like, and the and Arizona-Arizona State. Like, it, I just can't look at like what's called rivalry week and see BYU, Oklahoma state and KU Cincinnati and be like, yep, that makes a lot of sense. Yeah. The big 12 is definitely lacking in the the rivalry week experience. And especially since like the biggest one for the last 20 years is, is OU in Texas since the big 12 formed, but they don't, they always put, that's always played earlier in the season. So like you don't get that end of the year type of game like, you know, Alabama, Auburn, or Michigan, Ohio State, you know, Oregon, Oregon State, all of those, like, that's that's the one thing that the Big 12 is in an unfortunate position on. So, 
And then, you know, Bedlam used to be played at the end of the year. And then they started jostling it around. It's like, well, we can't have any Big 12 title rematches. And OU and O State have never been good in the same season, ever. So I don't know what the thought process on that was by the Big 12. But uh, we'll see what the Big 12 does because it, it would make things a little bit better and more enjoyable if they were able to to put something in place and, and have some more of those established games at the end of the year. Yeah, I mean uh... – it it can't get much worse than the rivalry spots this year. So yeah. Uh, real quick, by the way, shout out to Luke Fickle and the Wisconsin Badgers for an epic win last night uh, against Nebraska in overtime. Nebraska dramatically kicked a field goal with four seconds left to force OT, and then Wisconsin scored an OT and won twenty four to seventeen. Uh, since getting to five and three. Nebraska has lost three straight by a field goal to Michigan State, a field goal to Maryland, and a touchdown in overtime to Wisconsin. For Nebraska to get to bowl eligibility this year, they have to beat Iowa in Lincoln on Friday, 11 a.m. CBS. That is going to be a disgusting football game to watch, but very fun if you are anybody from like the old big eight big 12 and you want to see nebraska tears i can't wait to watch nebraska miss a bowl game because they lose four straight games by like one score and it's like a nine to six game that they play against iowa so uh bring on the hawkeyes and and let's see it give me your best one final game to show out brian ference do it for us (laughs) nebraska's quarterbacks versus iowa's defense is gonna be so funny oh that's a that is a great point (laughs) <laughs> uh hey do you know who played quarterback last night for nebraska uh was it uh chubba purdy it was chubba yeah there you go yeah uh, did, did he turn the ball over too or is that just all the other ones uh no chubba did he threw a pick he did throw an interception <laughs> in the game so oh god yeah, yeah. nebraska's qbs versus iowa's defense is gonna be a must see oh too. oh drew even better you know when he threw the pick Overtime? The last play of overtime. <laughs> wow. I can't believe it. I thought I, I thought only Adrian Martinez did that. Yeah, that's wild. I can't I can't believe that it just might be that you have something uh systemically wrong with your program <laughs> and that you just suck and you're a has been now. Uh and that you know you you hire bum ass coaches, but dang. I'm sorry for all the swearing on the show today. I've said <laughs> I've said a lot of B rated cuss words. A lot. I know, of, of, of the two of us, I thought it was going to be me that was going to be the unhinged one. Well, you got more sleep than me, I think, by by a nose. <laughs> by a so little. Yeah. I'm I'm a little wired and unhinged right now, so I, I'm I'm willing to say anything. I mean, I I took on Ben Heaney earlier uh, verbally. <laughs> I will. I would never take him on physically. I can tell you that much. Um, and I was gonna I was gonna say something there, but I'm not <laughs> because I don't want to get into real trouble. So. If you if you're a smart person and you know your uh, your your you know your stuff, I think you can guess what I was going to say there. But I'm not going to say it. I'm a I'm I'm a good individual. Uh, let me throw it up on the, the screen one final time. K State wins at 31 to 27 over Kansas. Uh, again, a lot of fun in the aftermath. Stressful 60 minutes, but the streak is alive. It lasts another year. 15 straight for K State. And now we wait and see what next year brings when the Sunflower Showdown comes to Manhattan. It could look a lot different next year. Who's going to be at quarterback for both teams? You know, where where are they going to be status-wise in college football? Because it feels like right now both are going to be top 25 teams for years to come, the way things are progressing. Um, it could be a big deal next season. So we'll wait and see. Next up for the Cats, it is Iowa State this Saturday, 7 o'clock on Fox D.Y. and I will be back here on Monday to uh, tie a bow on the KU game, get his thoughts, because uh, we haven't gotten to get gotten to hear from him or see him yet since uh, the game. So we'll see uh, how that goes down and what he thinks, and then start the prep for Iowa State and everything that comes with that. Also, uh, be, be aware, basketball in full force still. There will be a game on the Wednesday before Thanksgiving. So uh, not just the game against Miami on this Sunday that we're recording this, but also – one more left out there. So that will do it for us. Thank you to Drew and Fan. And uh, I'm Mason saying thanks for watching K-State Online. Keep locking in to everything we got going on on the YouTube, on three, anywhere else. 
uh, to consume all the K-State content you want. A lot of good stuff after the KU game and plenty more to come in the following week.